Thank you for joining us as Levi continues our study on the Book of Beginnings, the first book of Moses called Genesis. Everybody open their Bible to Genesis chapter 1. Let's open in prayer. Lord God, thank you for this day. Thank you for this time. Uh, thank you for all you're doing. Pray that you would speak to us through your word. Bless this time. Thank you for doing at the anchor. Thank you for what you've been providing. Thank you for protecting us. And thank you for the growth we've had and, and you, Lord, uh, and the things that are happening in the next coming years. Thank you for all you've been doing. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay, so I have your Bibles, Genesis chapter 1. And tonight we are doing Genesis 1 1. That's it. <coughs> Thanks for coming. All right? Genesis 1 1. So tonight's title is actually called Genesis 1 1. Very good. All right. To kind of give you guys a good understanding, as you see, there's pictures up here. Okay. These pictures are taken from the Paluxy River in Texas. And there's a reason why these are up here. Now, before we get to these pictures and what these mean, I'm going to pass out some verses so everybody can read. Okay. So I'm going to give Bill the voice. Uh, Exodus chapter 21 through 11. Uh, Nick. Isaiah 45, 18, Dutch's Colossians 1, 15 through 17, Garrett's Senior, Psalms 51, 10, and you said Rocky had her hand up? John 1, 1 through 3, Garrett Jr., Hebrews 1, 1 and 2, Joe, Exodus 31, 12 through 18. And then uh, we want to welcome those who are watching online from Texas and Oregon. And locally from Oceanside. All right. So let's start this off. Okay. Genesis. What does it mean? Beginnings. Beginnings. Because Genesis is a book of beginnings. Beginning. That's what we're talking about. Now, there's some questions that come with this. One of the questions that comes, the beginning of Genesis. How long was that? How did it begin? The question is, how did it begin? All right. Now, but the question really is what people ask is, the beginning of Genesis. How long was it? There's this argument of how long was the, the beginning of Genesis? And you have all these scientists that try to tell you, and they're Christian scientists, and then there's some really, really good scientists that do their research very well, and then it's what the Bible says it is, all right? Which we're going to look at in a little bit. But you have these scientists, and I'm not going to name them for just reasons, and they will argue some of the most silly arguments of craziness that when God created in the six days, it wasn't a literal six days. It was millions of years. That's not what the Bible says. And I'm going to prove it to you. All right. And you can even say to me, for you all who feel you are Bible scholars and know some of the Hebrew, and go, well, some of these words, they mean more than one thing. And, you know, it could be longer. Nope. There's a verse that destroys that in the Bible, which we're going to look at. Okay. Completely wipes out that whole argument. If these scholars would get past this first chapter and actually look at the rest, they would see that God himself destroys that argument. So here's the thing. How long is it? Now, it has to do again, like I said last week, with hyperspace. All right. So this is a quick breakdown of hyperspace. For you who don't know and for you who are like, oh, my gosh, we're going to get a science lesson. Don't worry. You'll be OK. OK. How many dimensions are we? Three. We're three-dimensional beings, okay? Two-dimensional is on a piece of paper. So if you ever wrote a stick figure or you drew, that's two-dimensional. Three-dimensional is us. It has a three-dimensional object. But hyperspace has to do with four dimensions of time and space, which science is now recognized as real. There's actually evidence to prove, which the science is now catching up with, which the Bible in Hebrew already said, that there are ten dimensions, right? And Genesis talks about these ten dimensions in the Hebrew language, science is now catching up to it with the, with the use of CERN and all this science. But time and space, when we look at it, okay? So, when it comes to time, what direction can we move? Forward. You can't go backwards. You can go forward. Yet God is outside time and space. Correct? He can appear anywhere at any time. He's eternal. He always was. He will always will be. Even if you can slowly slightly comprehend the idea of eternity it's still difficult because you can say okay here's a point where i was born and if i go forever that way that's eternity okay but the concept of from always coming from that direction is how we would see it and that is called for you guys remember school when you did a timeline what kind of timeline is that called 
Linear time, very good, linear time. It's I was born, I had my birthday, this is a big event in my life. Who remembers doing that in high school for like history? All right, the, George Washington was born on this day, he cut down his father's cherry tree on this, no he didn't, you know, and so on and so forth. Linear time. Linear time works really well with what? How many dimensions? One, two. two. It only really works well with two-dimensional world, not with a three-dimensional world. Here's another thing to kind of get you guys to understand hyperspace, okay? Who feels they're really good with math? Awesome. Okay, for you guys who feel really good with math, a triangle has how many degrees? Always. 180 degrees, right? No matter how you slice it, it's going to have 180 degrees. But here's the kicker. You take the concept of a triangle, no matter how many degrees you cut it in, and you go out here to Oceanside, and we say, hey, Nick, go all the way to that farthest point. Tiffany, go to this point, and Rocky, go to that point, and we measure it out. How many degrees will it come out to? No, it will not. It will come out to more than 180. Why? Curvature of the Earth. Yes. Because, again, 180 degrees triangle only works for how many dimensions? Two-dimensional, not three. And this is why pilots have to do certain math to make sure their planes land exactly. So the next time you're like, I'm going to go on a trip. We're going to go to Hawaii. We're going wherever. You got to think that pilot has to do math in his head to figure out, and a lot of the planes have it, that when they go up, not only they catch the wind speed and the rotation of the earth and the angle they're coming in, there's this all curvature in there and how it works. So this is a little bit what hyperspace has to do with it. And so another way to break this down, and there are people who can break this down way better than I can, all right? This is the most simplest way I'm gonna kind of give you an idea of how it works. Because again, linear time is one line. Like if I drew a line from me to Garrett Sr., and we put a timeline. But real eternity looks like what? Does anybody know? It's everywhere. And yet, it's all in one spot. It's everywhere, all in one spot. See, let's, let's use Garrett Sr. for example. Garrett Sr. in the year 2019 is sitting where right now? Okay. And if I went back in time and I had the power to go back in time, I, we could meet Garrett Sr. as a drill instructor. All right? We can meet Garrett Sr. as a private in the Marine Corps. We can meet Garrett Sr. as a 10-year-old. Yet, the concept of hyperspace and real eternity is that Garrett Sr. exists in all those spots at the same time. Yet, in our linear time, he's only here. But the time was set. Kind of, yes. Now, you may say, well, Levi, this sounds like some science fiction, H.G. Wells stuff. Well, Ephesians tells us what? We're already seated in the? How are we already seated in the heavenlies among the throne if we're seated in the anchor in 2019? Because it's already done. Because God is outside time and space. Here's another way to look at it. And this is going to be a little rough because I can't really show you in a diagram. But I will try to show you the best I can with this, okay? So, let's say, for example, so Mark's sitting over there. We got Katie sitting right here, Okay. And let's use Tony right here. Let's say those three are all right there. So let's say right here where this piece is that says in Hebrew, Shalom. This is the spot where God is in, in time, in our understanding of time. Okay. Mark lives back in the 1500s. And he is an explorer that is convinced that the world is round and he should go to explore it. Right. Katie lives during the Revolutionary War, and she's friends with Betsy Ross, and they're discussing what kind of flag they should put together, okay? And Tony is living today. And the concept to understand this of eternity is like this. In linear time, Mark would already be what? Dead. Dead. And Katie would already be? Dead. And Tony would be? Alive. Alive. So what happens is Mark, Katie, and we find out Next week, Saturday, Tony gets raptured because the rapture happens. The concept is all three show up at the throne of God at the same time. It's an it's a interesting concept. It's hard to grasp a little bit, but it's because it's more that time is a curvature. And the best way I can explain it is how 
Chuck Misler put it this way. He explained it like this. He said, imagine, this is his words, quote, imagine you are at a parade, like the Macy's Thanksgiving parade. If you're standing here, you can see the float coming, passing, and going, right? That's about it. But imagine you're up in a helicopter way above. You can see them getting ready to walk out and go. You can see who's in the parade right now, and you can see the very end of the parade where they're already staging for the very end, okay? That is the way you look at it. So to kind of give you an idea of eternity and time. All right, end quote. So that's the way you look at it. Chuck Miser breaks it down very, very well, just so you know, okay? This is just a quick, like, if you get it, great. If you don't, hey, it has nothing to do with salvation. Congratulations, all right? So let's go back to the idea of a literal six days. The Bible says that God created everything in six literal days. This is correct, all right? And we have scientists who follow Jesus and will try to argue it's millions of years. Well, let's look at Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 11. The second book of Moses called Exodus, chapter 20, verses 1 through 11. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Did you guys catch it? First of all, this is Moses getting what from God? The Ten Commandments, the Ten Commandments on the tablets. What did God say at the very end? For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. The Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. God himself said, I made it in six days. So there is no argument anymore. So all those scientists who are like, you're misunderstanding what this is saying. You're misunderstanding the Hebrew and what it means. So God misunderstood himself. Okay, let's look at Exodus 31, 12 through 18. The second book of Moses called Exodus, chapter 31, verses 12 through 18. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak also to the children of Israel, saying, Surely my Sabbaths you shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. You shall keep the Sabbath, therefore, for it is holy to you. Everyone who profanes it shall surely be put to death. For whoever does any work on it, that person shall be cut off from among his people. Work shall be done for six days, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest, holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. 
Therefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations as a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. And when he had made an end of speaking with him on Mount Sinai, he gave Moses two tablets of the testimony, tablets of stone, written with the finger of God. All right, so there again, on another area, Moses is told by God that he created it in six days. Okay? So how many days did he create it in? Six. Six days. Very good. Six days. Not six million, not six billion, not 65 million. Six. Okay, now, here's another suggestion for you to help you out, okay? There's a book I want you to recommend to you if you like reading. It's a challenging book. It's by a Jewish man. He is not a believer in Jesus. He's passed away. His book was considered, for his time, very controversial. But the man had some concepts that were very interesting. Chuck Smith recommended this book to people as well. And it's called Earth and Upheaval by Emmanuel Velosky. He was a Russian Jew, all right? And basically it destroys the concepts of uniformitarianism, which is the basis of the theory of evolution. Emmanuel Velosky, Velikovsky, excuse me, V-E-L-I-K-O-V-S-K-Y. Genius for his time, ahead of his time. And again, his books were banned in the US for a long time. <laughs> So, but he is a smart Jewish man that had some concepts. But these are one of those books that just basically destroys the argument from of evolution. And this is from, again, outside source that's not a Christian source. So sometimes when you're talking to an atheist about this, and they're like, well, you Christians all right the same. Okay, read this guy's book. He has no agenda. He has no preaching of Jesus. He is not about Jesus at this time. He just was a very, very intelligent scientist from Russia that, from what he discovered, proved there was all kinds of issues with evolution and the way he saw the science worked in the universe, all right? In fact, if you ever look at the science of the universe, it's very interesting how it works. They're even discovering now that the universe and the solar system is not a flat, like we would think a pool table surface. It's more like pockets where things sit and then it has its own gravitational poles. Very interesting. And what's very interesting too is as you're looking at science books and commentaries and all this stuff and you're studying, you will find that some have some good points, but think about this for a minute. If you were to look at a commentary like J. Vernon McGee, let's say of Genesis, for example, let's use him, who passed away already and he's gone. And then if you go back just what, months ago, they have an actual picture of a black hole and what they're discovering, it kind of, now what do you do? Even if you go back to the science books, like when I was in high school or when Bill was in high school, and then you look at what they understand now, what do you do? Because there's all this science moving faster. The thing is, you either have scientists that truly look at the science with objectivity and openness or with an agenda. And unfortunately, what you find mainly is an agenda. They have to push it a certain way. Now, let's get to these pictures of the Paluxy River. I want to show you this. But this is the kind of example. What do we see in this picture? Footprints. What kind of footprints? Dinosaur. Dinosaur and human. Okay. What are we told growing up in science about dinosaurs and human? They didn't live there. Separated by 65 million years. Even Jurassic Park. I love that movie. It's a great movie. 65 million years in the making, right? Jurassic Park. Dinosaur and human. These pictures or prints, which I also have the website here if you want to read it for yourself, okay? Are cut from the same rock, dated the same time. Look at this picture. This is another one, human footprints, okay? Cut from the same Paluxy River. Now, again, and a human footprints. Now, here's what I want to show you. Let's go back to that first one. What's wrong with that footprint? It's pretty big. Go to the next one. Now, they're big, next. It's big, and next, and big. So here's the thing, we have, the Paluxy River, you can go there if you're ever in Texas, has all these footprints. You know how I said scientists being objective? 
Okay, who's ever heard of a movie called Expelled? I recommend this documentary. Any scientist in the secular community that was like, well, I believe it's intelligent design. Fired, dismissed, disbarded, gone. What happened to being open? What happened to seeing where the science takes you? And what they found is you have all these pictures of the Paluxy River. And guess what they're beginning to discover? Scientists of certain groups are going out there and destroying the human footprint so they can't pull them anymore. I wonder why. I wonder why they don't want those dated. I wonder why they don't want them with dinosaur footprints. Why is it at the Paluxy River, all the footprints in one area are going one direction, all right? And there's even human footprints inside dinosaur footprints. And what they discovered in the, in the evidence is they saw that there was a rise in water and everybody was running the same direction. I wonder what that's about. The flood? Yeah. Yeah. But notice how they're giant footprints. I wonder what that's about. It's the Nephilim, right? Evidence for the Nephilim, which we will get into when we get to Genesis 6. All right. So that's just a little bit of this now. And now we're gonna look at this next picture. This is Genesis 1, 1 in Hebrew. And this is what it says in English. In English, it says in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, period. All right. God created the heavens and the earth, period. In Hebrew, Bereshit bara Elohim at Hashemaim va'at ha'aretz. All right. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now let's take a look at this a little bit. We have this word here to start with is bara, which means created out of nothing. And this word bara actually shows up in other parts of the Bible. In which we will look at as we move forward in scripture, you're going to see this, okay? Now, to kind of give you an idea as well, there's another Hebrew word called asa, which transliterates A-S-A-H, A-S-A-H. And it's the Hebrew letters Ein Shin He. All right, for you guys who remember that, asa. And it actually means is made. The word asa and bara are not the same. Bara means out of nothing. Because God created out of nothing. Asa means made, as if I took this chair, the wood, took it apart, and I made it something from what already existed. And what the Hebrew tells us, it was made out of nothing. Now that's hard to grasp. Nothing. There was nothing. And then there was. Because God said, let there be. And there was. He spoke it into existence. All right? So only God can borrow. Yes, only God can barra. No one else. No one can. We can asa and we can yatsar, which is the other Hebrew word, which is transliterated Y-A-T-Z-R. Y-A-T-Z-R. And it's the Hebrew letters Yud Sade Resh. Yatsa. Not to be confused with the yetzer, which is the helper. These asa and yatsa are made. To make from, all right, or it means to produce. So again, if you recycle, that's not a bara. That's a you're taking from something. I take the books and I recycle. I take the wood. I do something with it. Only God can do this. He can only create out of nothing. Okay. Again, it's when you think about this, this will rock your world a little bit. There was nothing. You mean darkness? No, nothing. You mean like, kind of like how they show in the comics where everything gets erased and there's just a character sitting in like white light, like it's a paper. No, nothing, nothing. There's nothing. The concept of nothing is hard for us. Nothing. Even movies that try to depict this, they depict outer space. No, nothing. There's no outer space. There's no stars. There's no planets. There's no boundaries. There's no nothing. 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 There's, yes, nothing. No protons. No atoms. Nothing. It's all gone. And all of a sudden, speak. And there it is. Hard to grasp. Now, the other part about Yatsar is about like a hand working in the clay. Where you take clay and you mold it into a pot or you mold it into something. That's what that's talking about. So, bara, very distinct. And again, shows up in other parts of scripture. Now, if you also look at bara, remember when we were looking at Hebrew, maybe some of you do, maybe some of you don't. We also have symbols of a sun, bar, and an authority. So we see the sun's authority there. But you don't have to be a Hebrew scholar to know this. 
You don't. Because again, the New Testament is concealed in the Old Testament, and the Old Testament is revealed in the New Testament. Okay? So, let's look at Isaiah 45, 18. The book of Isaiah, chapter 45, verse 18. For thus says the Lord, who created the heavens, who is God, who formed the earth and made it, who has established it, who did not create it in vain, who formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord, and there is no other. So God created it. He formed it to be inhabited. He didn't make it in vain. We'll look at that next time. But I just want to point that out. Again, we're going to see how Jesus is the creator. Let's get Colossians 1, 15 through 17. The epistle of Paul the Apostle to the Colossians, chapter 1, verses 15 through 17. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. Who is the image of who? The invisible who? Remember what Jesus said? To the disciples, show us the Father. If you see me, you've seen the Father. It is enough, right? He's creator, visible and invisible, made for him and by him. Okay? Let's look at Psalms 51.10. The book of Psalms, book 2, Psalm 51, verse 10. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Okay. Now, this little verse, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. These are one of the verses where it uses bara. Out of nothing, creating me a clean heart. Why? Because you have to. Yes, there's no other way. Now, God lives outside time and space. And again, we talked about this. Our mind's trying to grasp this. And it's very hard to grasp so let's look at John 1, 1 through 3. The Gospel according to John, chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. Who's the Word? Jesus, and the Word was God, and all things were made through Him. And it goes on, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. See, here, in the Hebrew context, it is saying, Bar, Son, Aleph, authority, the Son's authority. What does the New Testament already tell us? Who created it? Jesus. The Son did. Jesus did. He's there. He's a creator. As you see, we move forward. It says, when God walked with Him in the cool of the day, who was that? It was Jesus. He was there. He's, and he's in every part of scripture every page you can find them you can find them there typologies they call it christophanies which is a for uh, the the we actually shows up foreshadows all this now let's look at hebrews 1 1 through 2 the epistle to the hebrews chapter 1 verses 1 through 2 god who at various times and in various ways spoken time passed to the fathers by the prophets has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. Made the worlds, okay? Which actually in the Greek says he made the cosmos, which where we get the English word cosmos, all right? The, oh, the universe, he made it. He made it. This is, I mean, think about our galaxy is big. The universe is bigger. He made it. It's massive. Now, here's where it gets really interesting and fun. Okay? For some of you, you're going to love it. For some of you, you're going to look at me all sideways. There's a reason why we're looking at this. It's very important, this breakdown, to understand. First of all, this is not translated in English at all. Hot. And this is the beginning and end. The Aleph and the Tav. When you read in Revelation, I am the Alpha and the Omega, I am the Aleph and the Tav. 
They're right there. This means the only. The only. It means the only one. He's considered life. The only heavens and the only earth. Some pastors, they get this question of, well, what about extraterrestrial life? What would you do if they discovered extraterrestrial life? Well, they haven't. And every time people say they have these encounters with extraterrestrials, if you really study it well, it's demons. It's demonic spirits is what it is. They go through the most horrendous abuse and torment, and it's occultic practices to reach these things, and that's a whole different subject. The Bible talks about this. The Hebrew language is, is really a powerful thing. So I'm going to show you a couple things about this. So I'm going to have Nick zoom in on the first word. Okay. The first thing we're going to show you is how every one of these letters have a numerical value. You guys remember this from the Hebrew class? A numerical value. So when you're looking at this word right here, okay, and if you want to take down notes, basically, so you can see it for yourself, and if you kept your Hebrew alphabet, it's on there already. But this has a numerical value to it, and it's basically 2, 200, 1, 300, 10, and 400. Okay, that's the number, which adds up to 913. So this is 913. Okay? 913. So it has a numerical value. If you look at the next one, it's 2, 200, 1. 2, 201, which comes out to 203. The next one, Elohim, it has 1, 30, 5, 10, and 40. So 1, 30, 5, 10, and 40, which is 86. Very good. 86. At has the value of 1 and 400, which is? 401. 401. Very good. <laughs> And then we get to the word heaven, Hashemayim, all right, which has the value of 5, 300, 40, 10, and 40, which is 395. Va'at is 6, 1, and 400, which is 407. And the last part, which is the word for the earth, is 5, 1, 290. Which gives us 296. Now, when you add up all that, 296, 407, 395, 401, 86, 203, and 913, what do you get? <laughs> it's okay, I did it for you. You get 2,701. 2,701. That's what you get. 2,701. That is the value of the entire sentence of Genesis 1-1. The Bible also has a lot to do with prime numbers. There's a lot of prime 2,701 is 37 times 73. It's 37 times 73. Huh? So they're mirrors. In mirrors, yes. So their prime numbers is 37 times 73. They mirror. 3773. 3773. What you also find is 37 is the 12th prime number. And 73 is the 21st prime number. Again, a mirror. 12, 21. Now, let me ask you guys this question. Do you think this is an accident? Do you think this is an accident that you're seeing prime numbers that mirror each other in the sentence? This is a mathematical equation in the first sentence about God creating the heavens and the earth. Okay? And so when you look at it, 3773... Seven, seven, three, you also can break it down of 7 times 7 times 77. <laughs> which all those numbers mean what? Complete. Seven, 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 seven. Perfection. Perfection and completion. All right. Now it gets a little more interesting. So everybody take a deep breath. All right. Let it out. All right. You can feel the steam already rising. So again, the entire value of the sentence, 2,000. 701 is the prime numbers, 37 times 73, the 12th and the 21st prime number, 3773, 7 times 7 times 77. And those numbers in scripture mean completion and perfection. And this is in the first sentence of the Bible about creation. What did Isaiah say? I, the Lord, make the world to be inhabited. I do not make it in chaos or vain. 
but imperfection. Okay, now, here's the other kicker with this. It all starts to add up here a little bit. This word here, when you take this word here, bara, and you connect it to the word Elohim, so we got to zoom out for this, this word here, so bara and Elohim, you connect these two words together mathematically, you get 999. 999. When you take the word for creation, bara, and the word ought, okay, and you take the word for heaven, chashamayim, and you add those up together, it's 999. 999 in scripture, anybody want to take a guess what it is? And no, it is not the mark of the beast. Huh? Infinity. infinity, very good. It is infinity. Infinity. So, Bereshit, in the beginning, God, infinity, created the heavens, infinity. Okay, what were the English words again? The English words are, in the beginning, God. In the beginning, God. Infinity. Those add up to? 999. In the beginning, God. In the beginning, God. The next part. Created the heavens, infinity, God. In the beginning, infinity. God always was and is. He is, he was, he is to come. Infinity, infinity, infinity. Again, accident? No. no. Well, this is written by Matt. So, I mean, they, they, they got together and they put this together. Man, you write a book with mathematical equations <laughs> and another language <laughs> in it. And then you come see me. See, even Nick's over there trying to be challenge accepted and he can't. <laughs> it's impossible. You can't unless the Lord has done it. Now, here's where it gets even better. I love this. All right. So that's just the infinity. Now, you take God, Elohim, God. Okay. Which, by the way, what's up with that word God? It's plural. It's plural. El, God, Elohim, plural. Plural. Oh, what's that about? Trinity. The Trinity. Very good. So you take the word God, Elohim. Okay. And then you take the word for heaven. Hashemayim. All right? And you take and the. So basically, God and the heaven, and the heavens, and you get 888 mathematically. 888 mathematically. What is 888 in scripture? Jesus. It's Jesus. Yeah. It's the numerical number for Jesus. 888, the numerical number for Jesus. So God and the heavens points to who? Jesus. Again, accident? No. No. Not an accident. Last one. And then we're going to move on to the next part. You're like, this is already too much. It hurts. Elohim, God, the heavens, the earth. God, the heavens, the earth. Okay? Mathematically, 777. Seven, seven. Seven, seven, seven. Very good. <laughs> Which is what? Complete. Completion. Perfection and holiness. 777 is perfection and holiness. God, the heavens, the earth. Perfection and holiness. Mathematically, this all points to a perfect creation. Think about that for a minute. So now, you read that first verse. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Who here has read that Blown over it and be like, yeah, we get it. Create the heavens and earth. Let's get on with this story. Anyone? Maybe. Is there a reason why we don't blow over things? Yes. Are you probably going to get this in one sitting? Maybe not. You got to look at it a little bit. But it's right there. There's another equation in there we're not even going to get to for the equation of pi. Because 3.14 is in there. And what you find is when you look at it with pi, 3.14, you'll get 3.14777888999999. Now, that's not an accident either. And the Jewish rabbis will tell you that that's there. It's the same with John 1.1. 1, 1. There's a mathematical equation there where you get E equals MC square. Jesus coming into our world is E equaling MC square. Mathematically. Okay. Look at it on your own. I want to move on to the next point. That is called gamatria, what I just showed you. That's gamatria. Now, did you find this on your own? With the help of some people, I found a little bit. Of it. I am not the author of this. In fact, the original people who found it were rabbi scholars in the 1500s. 
in the 1500s, all right? <laughs> but there are people who have perfected along the way, and my Hebrew teachers helped me out a lot with this. Now, what I want to show you is I worked on this, and I ran it by my Hebrew teacher. She kind of looked at it, and then she's like, wow, you're on something. And then her words to me in Hebrew class was, you got a knack for this, and you really like it. I go, yeah, I do. I have to slow down a little bit because I can spend hours on it, all right? And uh, I won't show my assistant Whoa. Nick over there because he will go with a tinfoil hat and never come out of his room. Pages and pages of this stuff. Yeah, but people don't notice stuff. So I'm showing you. If I would suggest to you study it yourself if you get to that level and then see what happens. Just what I'm telling you is be careful. Don't end up in some weird rabbit trails. If you come back to me and you're like, I found the date of the rapture. No, you did not. Oh, yeah. All right. <laughs> Let's go back to this sentence structure again. And what I'm going to show you here. Hebrew has how many layers to it? Anyone? 47. It's actually seven. The Hebrew scholars will say seven. Now I've heard the argument of 700, 70, 707. But how many layers to the Hebrew language? Layers. Yeah. Not letters. No, layers. So seven. <laughs> no wonder Bill, Bill's like seven letters. We just learned this. <laughs> seven layers. Okay, like a parfait. Like All right. A like a, yes, like Joseph's favorite burrito, a seven-layer burrito. That's Taco Bell. With 666 cheeses. Now, turn on the thingy caps. Here we go. You need to really think this one through. If you're going to take down notes, now's your time to do it. Let's look at this first word. Bereshit. 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 On the surface means beginning. Beginning. Okay? In the beginning. Beginning. Bereshit. Bet resh alef shin yud tav. Bereshit. Now, in here, there are layers to this, all right? So you peel it away, or you like Joseph's seven-layer burrito, all right? So in here is the word time. That's one part, time. In here is also the word head of the house, head of the house. There is the word for a fire covenant. So let me show you. So you're not just like, what are you talking about? Let me show you. Fire, right here, sheen is fire. Uh, Brit is covenant, a fire covenant, all right? Remember that word for sun, bar, bara, all right? So we have the head of the house, we have the fire covenant, the symbol for time, all right? And finally, there's also a message of the gospel in all this. And I'm going to give it to you in chunks, and then I'm going to read the whole thing to you, unless you put it together for yourself. As I give you this, and you see the message... Don't scream it out, because in the end, I'm going to read you the entire thing. The first part is the son serving the father, the three in ones, plural, the three in ones hand in the covenant. The son serving the father, the three in ones hand in the covenant. And that's in the first word. The three in ones hand in the covenant. And this is the word for in the beginning, Bereshit. So what I find fascinating is not even this is talking about creation, but the word for time is in here. But outside eternity, is there time? No. But in creation, there's time. Time begins. Okay. Next word, Barra. Barra. Again, we have son's authority. The son's authority. Because Jesus is the creator, correct? Son's authority. All right, so here's the word for son, Aramaic, authority. And then we have also a message in here that has son serving the father. Son serving the father. Okay? Son serving the father. This is God, in plural. But it also has the word in there, behold. Behold! All right? We see that throughout the Bible. We have the word for day in here. Days. Day. And so we also have in here what says, Behold the day of God. In the word Elohim. Behold the day of God. Okay? Now, that's a couple layers of the surface. The bottom layer of the surface with this message has this. Right here. And for the word for God, Elohim, in one of the titles. The man with the Holy Spirit in the day of God. 
the man with the Holy Spirit in the day of God. Okay, next. Father, covenant. Father, covenant. So basically it says Father's covenant. Next. Hashemayim. Heavens. We have the word for space in here. Behold. And this is a really cool one. If I remove these letters and I have mem yud mem, what word is that? Waters. Waters. And this is an article for the, and the sheen represents what? Three and one. No, no, but three and one, but it represents fire. Fire water. So the word in heaven is fire water. And the rabbis teach this too, whether they believe in Jesus or not. Fire water. All right. What's plasma? Well, there's a theory that the fourth state that of liquid. from water, all the elements mm -hmm. could be created in a plasma environment. In a plasma environment. Superheated. But all the elements. And it is a theory because God said he created out of nothing. So we have fire water. We also have this message in there. Ready? This is the message in here for heaven. The man with the Holy Spirit, the man with the Holy Spirit through fire and water. The man with the Holy Spirit through fire and water. The man with the Holy Spirit through fire and water. Next. This one's a little bit simpler. It has the symbol of and, Father Covenant. What's the word? This is va'at. This would be considered and, and it would skip this part, the earth. So there is no translation here for this. So this would be and Father's covenant, but it also has the nail, the Father's covenant. The nail, the Father's covenant. Next, the last word, earth. Paretz. This is the symbol for matter. Time, space, matter. Let me say it again. Time, space, Matter. Hmm. That's in creation, isn't it? Time, space, matter. This also has the Aramaic word for light. It has the word for righteousness in here. And so it has a message in it that the man with the Holy Spirit has righteous light. The man with the Holy Spirit has righteous light. Okay. So when you read this whole thing across the board, looking at the layered message in here. This is the really cool thing you get. The son serving the father. The three in one's hand in the covenant. The son serving the father. The man with the Holy Spirit in the day of God. The father's covenant. The man with the Holy Spirit through fire and water. The nail, the father's covenant. The man with the Holy Spirit has righteous light. We get that whole message in the New Testament. Jesus died to set us free. What does the Bible say? Before the foundations of the earth, Jesus was what? Crucified. Crucified. The message is in there. Let me read it again. The Son serving the Father. Jesus said what? Paul said that Jesus submitted himself even unto yeah. death. The Son serving the Father. The three in one. Who's the three in one? The Trinity's plan. The three in one. God's hand in the covenant. That they made the son serving the father again, submitting himself to the father, the man with the Holy Spirit in the day of the Lord. Who's that? No, who's that? If we have the Holy Spirit in the day of the Lord, who sealed us? That's us sealed by the Holy Spirit for the day of judgment, the day of the Lord, the day of God, the father's covenant, the man with the Holy Spirit again, who? Us through what? Fire and water. What's that about? Fire and water. The flood and the flood. And the flood and the flood. No. Well, baptism. It's the flood first, the fire. Baptism. Baptism. Ah, from the For you guys, who is baptism for salvation? No. But when we follow Christ, the Holy Spirit comes upon us. We get baptized in the fire, and what do we do? I'm oh, we baptized, man. Let's go on the beach, baptize me. I'm dead. I'm buried with Christ, risen anew. The old Levi's dead. And that's why the fire was on them and set the presence of the Lord. Correct. Correct. The man with the Holy Spirit has righteous light. 
Because every good gift comes from the Father of lights. Light. Ah, uh, there it is, hidden in the message. But yet, the New Testament told us that already. Because the mysteries revealed were already revealed. What was the greatest mystery revealed for us? Jesus, Jesus is the Messiah that would come and die and set us free. From the foundations of the earth, from beginning, from eternity, it was set in motion. And there are many, many other mysteries like this. So I took this to my Hebrew teacher. I showed it to her. And she was like, whoa, I love it. And I have done this for Genesis 1, 2, 1, 3, 1, 4. And I'm still working on it. It's going to take me a while. Do I want to publish anything? No. Because the biggest thing, and people are like, dude, you got to publish this. You got to do a commentary. Blah, 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 blah. Even my friend Ruben's like, bro, you should really write a commentary. Freely I have received, freely I want to give. That's why I love this place. It's all free. Free, free, free. The Lord provides. If you take the time, you'll find it. And what did I tell you last week? If you find something that seems like a contradiction or a mystery, amen, because you should do what? Dig further, because the Bible will answer it. Because there are no contradictions. There's just these awesome mysteries. Every time someone's like, I found a contradiction. Did you really? Did you really? Well, in the Gospel of Matthew, it says, Jesus was leaving Jerusalem in this situation. And then Mark says he was entering Jerusalem. See, it's a contradiction. Is it? Is it? Because no, it actually, when you read it, Jesus was leaving upper Jerusalem and entering lower Jerusalem. That would be like me saying, Fernando drove to the Carolinas. Fernando entered the Carolinas. Fernando left Carolina. Well, what would he do? He went into South Carolina and left North Carolina. Are they both the Carolinas? North Carolina, South Carolina. Yeah, I'm in the Carolinas. You see what I'm getting at? It's not a contradiction. It's upper Jerusalem, lower Jerusalem. As you look at this, there is this. This is why tonight is only Genesis 1-1. One, one. <laughs> yes. All right. A beautiful, beautiful message put in here. Next week, we will do Genesis 1-2. All right. That's why my wife is joking that the rapture will happen before we finish this book. All right. So, not... Every study will be one verse. Some will be maybe three. But, <laughs> but I'm telling you right now, it's going to be Genesis 1, 2, and then Genesis 1, 3 through 5. That's where I'm at. Yes. When the war broke out in the, in the angels of God, and along this timeline, when did that occur? That's what we'll talk about next week. Yes. Next week, we will discuss that and get into that part about Genesis 1, 2, and all the verses that kind of give us clues. All right. So, let's close in prayer. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for this day. <laughs> thank you for all that you're doing. Um, thank you for your awesome message that's in here, Lord. And thank you that um, you had a plan, Lord God, to set in motion before we could even comprehend that there was nothing. And that you were there, always existing. Lord, it is so awesome your word and what you do and the mysteries that are in it. It is so awesome how you speak to us. And yet someone can take the time and the language and look at all these things and Holy Spirit, yet you reveal it to the smallest of children to understand the basics of following you. Lord, we I love the fact that your word is so deep. Theologians can't touch the bottom yet. So shallow babies won't drown in it. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for your precious, precious word. Lord, we just, uh, we lift up this place and this group to continue growing as we go through Genesis. Lord, we, we lift up the surrounding churches around here and to strengthen them and to keep your angels around them. We lift up, Lord, the Mendes family and put your angels around them and keep them strong and encouraged. And all that is happening there, Lord, and give them direction and guidance. Lord, we love you and we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. That concludes this week's study. Please join us next time as Levi continues our exploration of the book of Genesis with Genesis chapter 1, verse 2.